And good morning, everyone. Welcome to Small Biz Matters, the half-hour program where you work on your business rather than in it. My name is Alexi Boyd, your trusted admin advocate, advisor, friend, friend to small business, everything you want me to be, really. But here on Small Biz, we talk all about small business. We educate our listeners and we have fantastic experts on the show as we do today. Now, I just wanted to pick up on a, a bit of a topical news today. Uh, I'd like to congratulate Philip Ruddick, who is our new mayor. We look forward to working with him closely here at Triple H Community Radio, as well as uh, my role on the Chamber of Commerce as well. I'm, I'm looking forward to having having Phil uh, in, in some good discussions, some good hearty discussions about the future and the progress of Hornsby. It's going to be some interesting times. He's uh, he said some interesting things about uh, in relation to development, um, which I'm sure the Greens side of council will be very intrigued to hear about his opinion on that. And um, we're looking forward to some change. It's going to be it's going to be great here for the people of Hornsby. And also a big congratulations to the Greens party, of course because they've got two candidates, possibly more, um, and the Liberal candidates from past and present uh, are going to be with us as well. Nathan Tilbury has retained his seat in A Ward, which um, I'm just going to personally say I'm very happy with. I think Nathan does a great job. But it will be interesting to see how we go with um, with the future of Hornsby and hopefully this stagnation process, which I very publicly said and happily said has been going on for the last few years, hopefully um, we will see some vibrancy injected and uh, the good people who work at Hornsby Council will be able to be supported and working hard on their projects with hopefully that $20 million back from Parramatta. That'd be awesome to just get that money back again. Thank you very much. Uh, So um, yes, uh, interesting times ahead. I hope everybody went to their local school and bought a sausage sizzle and a compulsory cake for Saturday night afternoon tea. Uh, And uh, thank you very much for everyone who came to Hornsby North to support us. Now on with the show today, we're here with uh, Vicky Reiter. Now Vicky is a very well-known public speaker and expert in her field when it comes to, um, I'm going to say this all wrong, Vicky. So let me just say welcome to the show and then you can do your spiel. Thanks for coming on the show today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And it's been ages. We've been talking about having you on the show for quite a while and I'm I'm super excited because it's uh, um, it's it's a field that small business doesn't often think about when it comes to, co- well, they do have business coaches that are in the realm of small business coaching, but you're, you're not an expert in that. You're an expert in a different kind of professional development. Can you tell me a little bit about your journey? Yeah. So look, I guess my background has come from, you know, I've been working in corporate world for, for many years, but whilst I was working in corporate world, I was really traveling the world, working with and studying with, you know, people that really specialized in the development of human potential. And so I have worked for many years in that field, taking all of the lessons that I've learned from, you know, all of these experts all around the world and really packaging up, I guess, a program and a methodology that can be rolled out to to businesses either from, from you know, for themselves and also for their employees as an employee benefit program. So I guess the, you know, the angle that I come from is really a, a holistic kind of viewpoint. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the research that I've done around peak performance the development of human potential has really led me down a path of recognizing that we are fully integrated holistic human beings and every single part of our life will affect each other and so one kind of you know you can't just look at one element of our life in isolation there's there's multiple elements that really need to be looked at in totality and so that's really been i guess the the mantra and provided me a platform i guess to develop a lot of my content and it has really been um the catalyst uh, for me, developing my 360 degree solution fit for life program, which is a yeah, we're going to we're going to talk about that a little bit later because that's that's quite a, an interesting point. Is that when it comes to small business, I mean, I think that is it is really purely holistic because you've got so many different elements of your life that contribute to yourself as a business. It's about you know, you, are you the profile? Are you this? Are you the business? Is it just you? Therefore, it's part and parcel is your personal life and your family life and your financial life and all those other bits and bit pieces that roll into it. And we talk about wearing many hats on the program and the importance of outsourcing, but I guess we don't talk enough about those different elements that make up who we are and therefore what make up the business. And so hopefully today when we when we go through um, your program a little bit, people will learn uh, how to implement some of those strategies in their business life, but also for their personal life as well, because we're it's one and the same, isn't it? Interlinked, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, we are our business and our business is us. Yep. Even if you sell widgets. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> exactly right. So um, tell me a little bit more about that journey that you went on when you were when you were travelling around. You said you, you met a, a 
people who were about holistic living. Can you go into that a little bit more? Who, who, what sort of people were you coming across and which countries were you in? Yeah, so I do a lot of uh, study over in the United States. Um, you know, many years ago I was studying neurolinguistic programming. I started off that kind of journey here in, in Australia and then went over to America and studied to be a trainer of neurolinguistic programming. And that's really about... You're going to need to tell me what that uh, that's is. That's really about... Um, neurolinguistic programming is really, I guess, uh, a methodology that really helps you to understand how you process and store information. So mm. it's about motivation triggers. Mm. Um, I went over to the States and became a trainer of, of neurolinguistic programming. And more recently, I've been studying over in the States on a program called Strategic Coach, a gentleman by the name of Dan Sullivan. I've been part of that program now for six years. So for one night, every 90 days, I travel over to LA um, to be part of this entrepreneurial program. And really, you know, that program in itself has provided me with a lot of insight about um, about you know, about business, about entrepreneurialism, about packaging up um, your own wisdom and what you're passionate about and taking taking to market a proposition that's a little bit different to potentially what other people who might be in the same market uh, are, are taking to market. Because at the end of the day, I think particularly in business, one of the things that I've learned is that we live in a commoditized world and everybody is competing on price. You know, we live in a discount economy and people don't want to pay full price for anything anymore. So if you're a business owner, how do you start to think differently about the value that you bring to the table and how do you repackage up your offering so that it looks different to other people who might have a similar kind of product to what you do so that, you know, this whole price comparison piece becomes not even part of the conversation. And, you know, a lot of those lessons that I learned um, through that program helped me to package up my own proposition, mm. which is this, you know, Fit for Life program. And, and that's really what I learn about, you know, about building a, a holistic model that really looks at kind of every element of someone's life. I really like that phrase. I really love that phrase that you use, which was um, packaging up the wisdom. Mm. And that's so true, isn't it? Because we do try and talk about differentiating ourselves. How can we stand out? How can we niche in our particular market? But um, I don't think we, we, we sing our own praises enough about the wisdom that we bring with us. Yep. Because we sing our praises when it comes to customer service because we all answer emails at stupid o'clock and we, we're there and we're, we're, we're trying to do our best for our clients because that's what small business does best. But we're not very good at singing our own praises. Yep. And it's something I've been sort of contemplating lately when I've been thinking about my daughters and, and how to give them a bit more of this sort of positive reinforcement. And nobody talks about pride. Nobody talks about being... Nobody uses the words, and particularly girls... I am proud of, I'm mm. proud of myself because I've done this. People give you a compliment and you go, oh, no, 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 don't be silly. It's like, what are we, in the 50s? So it's like packaging up that wisdom. I love that phrase that you used because we bring with us as small business owners a great deal of life experience, which in our industry, thank goodness, is actually appreciated. But it's hard to find that way of, of selling that wisdom as mm. part of your package. Yeah. Is there, is there a particular tip... I know it's hard because you can't, we're talking so broadly today that often we, we talk about practical strategies on the show. It's not like I can go, well, just, just make sure you, you put that word in your LinkedIn profile. I mean, what, what is it that people can do to tap into that wisdom that mm. they have a little bit better and sell it? Are there any sort of practical yeah. strategies you can think of? Look, again, Alexi, one of the things that I, um, I've learned over the years and something that I'm very passionate about and very fortunate to have, I guess, tapped into is is really uncovering what your area of excellence is or your unique ability, your genius. Um, I think, again, as business owners, we go into business because we're passionate about something. We've got, you know, something that, of value that we've got to offer. But I think once we get into business, then we start packaging up all of these other bits and pieces. We become, you know, responsible for doing a whole lot more than what we ended up getting into the business to start with. So I think it's about, firstly, really getting clear on what you're passionate about and what your unique ability is or your area of excellence and finding out what your strengths are and actually starting to think about how you can package up something around those strengths. Um, and I guess, you know, from my perspective, I would it's almost kind of developing a bit of a, a signature system that can potentially be all uniquely named and it looks different, it's packaged up different um, and it's all focused around the value that you specifically bring 
to the table, which is all about your strengths. And this is where outsourcing to a very, very good branding expert and a very good absolutely graphic designer is so important. Exactly. And, you know, and that's the, the next piece is once you find what your area of excellence is, then it's not about being all things to all people. It's about now surrounding yourself with other people who have an area of excellence in an area where you might have a weakness. Are you saying B and I? Am I hearing you say B and I? Um, I guess that concept springs to mind because obviously there's people within a, a B and I environment that bring different kind Areas of elements. Of expertise, yeah, yeah. Um, but in you know within your own business, it's about you know even if you're a one man band, it's about finding as you say a graphic designer that specialises only in doing graphic design and, and is external your, to your business where you outsource that function to mm, them mm. or bookkeeping. Bookkeeping. Or, we love our bookkeeping. You know, or website design or social media or, you know, all of those kinds of things and really surrounding yourself with experts that bring something to the table that you don't have. And I would say, again, back in the business environment, in your own business, and working with your own team is really helping them uncover what their area of excellence is and trying to almost structure functions and jobs and tasks that align to those kinds of areas so that they're operating in unique ability or genius. Now, this takes us back to your role as, um, am I right in saying executive coach in terms yeah, of the coaching, pr- yes. presentations? Yeah. So if, if you were putting that into a corporate environment, can you explain to me how a, a small business can recognise those strengths of their individual staff members to niche them, to help them develop, to train them up better. How do you even recognise that in the first place when you've only been working with someone for a couple of months, for example? Well, I think, you know, I go through a bit of a kind of a self diagnosis. I've got a, a couple of tools that really allow the staff members to uncover that for themselves. So it might just be sitting down with a piece of blank paper and actually writing down all of the different functions and tasks that they perform on a daily basis. So over a period of time, just start tracking, you know, opening the mail, attending meetings, calling clients, doing invoicing, whatever it might be. And then from there, really getting, a, I, I guess, applying a lens over the top of that and saying, well, out of all of the tasks that I perform on a daily basis, which ones really sit in that unique ability or area of excellence? The ones that I'm truly passionate about, and the mm. ones that I'm really good at. And proud of. And proud of what percentage of of my time is made up of those tasks and then it's about really recognizing from there what tasks do I do that I do very well but I'm not really you know all that passionate about I can do them well um, but if I had the choice I'd probably you know maybe rather give them to someone else and then it's kind of about tasks that potentially drain you of energy you're not you're you're incompetent at and when you have to do them they take you three times as long because you just don't have a skill set in those areas. Mm. So I think firstly getting very clear about the types of tasks and functions that you're performing and then overlaying that with you know a bit of intelligence to say what percentage of my time is being made up of those tasks and then putting them into what I call a, a canvas, which is kind of a, um, if you just say a square, let's say, uh, which kind of, which sit in the area where I'm quite passionate and what percentage of time the areas that kind of I'm spending some time in that really drain me of energy. Tasks that I would actually like to do, but I probably need a little bit of development in. So what what percentage of, you know, of tasks kind of fit into that area? And then from there, really working out a plan and a strategy to do more of the things that you're good at and work out across the business who might have a skill set in some of those other tasks or functions where you potentially have a weakness. Because, you know, one of the things that I learned, again, through this program over in the States, um, Strategic Coach, is... When you start to offload some of the things that you're doing that you really don't have that much of a passion for, you don't really have a great skill set in those particular areas. When you start to find people that do have a skill set in those areas, well-being goes up for everybody. You know, you're all, taking it away from the people who hate it. You're the, giving it to people, people who that love it. it. Yeah. So everyone starts to operate in this area called peak performance because everybody's operating in the place that they perform best at. Yeah. Um, and so well-being goes up. You have, you know, greater productivity. You have uh, less sick leave. You know, absenteeism present. All that stuff kind of starts to disappear. And we know, again, through the research that people that are focusing on their top five strengths every single day are 600% more engaged in work and 300% more satisfied with their own lives. So there's statistics and science and research 
that underpins what it is we're talking about today. And the key to well-being and to productivity and building a successful business is to really start focusing on what it is you're good at, what it is you love, and the value that you bring to the table and really looking for people to support you um, in being able to you know, delegate or hand off tasks that perhaps you don't really have that much passion for. And, th- and those are great tips for management as well, for management of staff, yeah. because I know in the back of our minds, when you start a small business, you're you're not sure, A, who to hire first. I mean, that's the starting point. And then once you've got a team of maybe five or six, um, it is a bit of everyone's doing everything. I've seen it in my role as a bookkeeper coming in externally, and I just watch people nobody really knows what they're doing and they're floundering about a bit and they might be given more money but that definition of giving them a a pay rise is just a pay rise it's not really giving them more responsibility or taking away the stuff they don't want and the ones that work successfully are because people are saying well this is your defined role this is what I only want you to do I want you to take the things you're good at and I want you to train someone else to do the stuff you don't want to do, mm. get rid of it, which I guess it, it, again is quite empowering um, and anything that you're, you're not so great at but I still need you to do, I recognise now that I need you to be trained in it and I need to give you some training as well. So this, these are awesome management techniques. And, Absolutely. And, and this is the problem because we see so many times with businesses who are very successful where you've got a, a guy who owns it who's in there, so a female a female who owns it, who is who is running the place but also doing everything herself as well and still micromanaging everyone because she's doing everyone herself. What's, what's a practical strategy to sort of extract yourself from that? Is it as simple as maybe sitting down and doing this sort of exercise with your staff and recognising what their strengths are? Without question. I think without question it's a really great exercise for, for really empowering people to, number one, uncover, you know, where their where their time ultimately should be spent and then seeing whether or not there is a layer of or level of flexibility for you to be able to potentially start to restructure you know some roles or some time even just the t- amount of time that you know they might be spending in certain areas or giving them the flexibility that you know there might be certain things that just can't be changed because that's just the way that the job is and it needs to be done but perhaps the route that's taken to get to the outcome might be different and it might have a layer of flexibility where they can use you you know, a way or a, a strategy that, you know, kind of taps into to what they're passionate about. So I think it's really about firstly going through an exercise of, of helping people really uncover where they're spending their time, what they're passionate about, where their skill set lies in and seeing whether or not there might be any flexibility to start to utilise the the value and the, and the strengths of the other people that are in that business. And there's also nothing worse than having being in a position or being in a job where you're completely underutilised. There's nothing more demoralising. It's boring. Mm-hmm. Nobody wants to go to work and spend 40 hours of your week in a place where you're not being recognised for your strengths and and you despise what you do and you're not even doing what you thought you were had signed up for and you're wasting your time. People really don't like that. They want to be in a place that they want to stay in. They want to grow and flourish and yep. give something back to the business. I don't think any employee wants to be that. That's right. You know, you know work is a tonic isn't it? You know, when you go to work and you feel like you're making a contribution, a positive contribution, then you feel good about yourself. Mm. And, you know, again, I've done a significant amount of research around wellbeing and specifically the work of Gallup, who designed the science of strengths. And they've they've come up with five key areas of wellbeing. The number one most important key piece in finding wellbeing in our lives is career wellbeing. And it is about having a purpose for getting out of bed every single day and loving what we do. If we do not have that in our lives, it is a spiral down. And, you know, again, I had it validated last year. I spoke to a bunch of GPs. 26% of people are seeing a GP for anxiety and depression. And the majority of reasons that they're they have twenty six twenty six percent, and it's on stats. the it's on the rise. Um, it's only going to get worse, and a very large portion of people that have anxiety and depression ha- do not like what it is that they do. They have, you know, that they're, they're not in an environment where they're focusing on their strengths. They're going to work. They're not productive. They don't feel like they're making a difference. They don't feel like they're making a positive contribution. So, there is real reason, uh, you know, science and research that really um, gives us the rationale for making sure that we can create an environment where people are focusing on what it is that they're good at. Because when that happens, well, firstly, we're twice as likely to thrive in life overall. If we actually do have career wellbeing in our life, the research says that we are twice as likely to thrive in our life overall if we have that element correct. Yeah, And it has 
dramatic impacts on profitability and you know productivity in the workplace so mm, mm. and not just for the business owner but for those people who work for them as well oh totally and staff retention oh yeah. my goodness i'm always banging on about staff retention but the highest expense for businesses is not the wages and the salaries but actually the cost of replenishing and retraining and bringing on new staff and retrenching staff if need be you know it takes you know if if a person leaves a business it's usually about you know five or six months before someone can come in and actually be competent at doing the job. And you think about the expense associated with that, the recruitment costs, the training costs, taking someone else out of their day to train the new person, you know, all of that kind of stuff. I mean, it's it's a huge, huge cost. So mm. getting it right to start with mm. is... And keeping your staff yeah, happy. Absolutely. <laughs> Look, we're going to take a quick a short break for a community service announcement and then we'll be back after that. Uh, we'll check the traffic and we'll be back talking with Vicky a little bit more about your program called The 360 Degree Solution. You are listening to Triple H 100.1 FM. And today, of course, we have... Vicky Writer, who is an expert in her field when it comes to um, coaching and supporting businesses and helping them understand to get the best out of their employees. We were just talking about that a little bit before the program, actually, and just really great management tips on for small businesses to help support your uh, employees in their role, but also get the most out of them and the importance of making sure that they don't stagnate. Um, and it's an important topic, isn't it, Vicky? Because um, a lot of I guess a lot of uh, businesses lose time, money, resources because they're not looking after that element of their business. It's not just about making money. You have to look after your staff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's, um, you know, most of us are in the people business, aren't we? We've got people that we're w- that are working for us. But at the end of the day, if if they're not happy, it's going to, it's going to have a detrimental impact to our bottom line. Mm. So mm. we, we absolutely need to take care of people. We need to make sure that they're kind of operating in, you know, in um, in this space called peak performance where people are actually wanting to come get out of bed in the morning and actually walk into the office. Now, tell me a little bit about the 360 degree approach. Now, this is something you, at the beginning of the program, you're telling us about all the wonderful um, uh, mentors that you've had and the, the strategies and things that you've learned while traveling overseas, particularly in the US. They seem to be well ahead of us in mm. this regard when it comes to tapping into potential and, and all that sort of thing. So you've, you've developed this, this program. Tell us a little bit about that. Thank you for sharing this with us, by the way. And those of you who are listening, we'll pop this up on the Facebook page on Small Biz Matters as well. So you can um, have a look at that as, as you listen. So tell me a little bit about, about this, this concept. Yeah. So the first thing I guess, you know, I got really clear on Alexi when I first started kind of, I guess, unpacking my IP around this was really identifying what I was passionate about, what I was good at, Mm. you know, what my strengths were. And what I'm really good at is coaching, development and mentoring. And when I think about those things, and then I, I thought about, you know, I've been researching human behavior and motivation and the development of human potential for 20 years. What do I know about all of those concepts? And so I unpack my IP by kind of just doing a bit of a brain dump around all of those different topics. And then what I realized very quickly was that there was a an integrated solution that needed to be put in place. A lot of coaches are out there talking about kind of single elements. Mm, yeah, you um, do get that a lot as well, particularly in the life coaching side of things is they just they just find they just tease out one thing and that's it, right. It's not about that. It's yeah, about the package. Absolutely, because every part of our life will affect each other. And I worked out very quickly that, you know, our health and lifestyle choices will directly impact our economic life and our financial security. Our financial security and economic life will directly impact our health and lifestyle choices. And both of those two things are completely underpinned by how we feel about ourselves, our overall well-being, our life satisfaction and our emotional fitness. And so... Emotional fitness. That is a great term. Yeah. Emotional fitness. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. So, you know, this program that I've packaged up, it really looks at those three areas, if you like. And I've developed this, you know, 360 degree approach, which is part of my Fit for Life program that really taps into, you know, helping people uncover where they sit across each of those three areas and really giving them the strategies, tools and concepts to work out where they are, where they want to be and giving them a platform, I guess, to plug the gaps that exist in their life so that they can move from where they are now to ultimately where they want to be. So it's... Yeah. So is it, I like the way it sort of finds the strengths first and then maybe the weaknesses and what needs to be yeah. pulled up on that. Um, what would be some examples of some weaknesses that you typically see in um, in small businesses? I think I know what you're going to say anyway, but please, you tell oh, us. Oh, look, you know, 
again, everyone's, you know, an individual and we all have different backgrounds and different experiences and different things. But, you know, honestly, the one common piece that I see come out of this program is the whole career piece and focusing on people's strengths, you know, that whole element for people because, and again, what I'm seeing out of the back of the program is validation for the research. I know through, you know, the, the specifically the work of Gallup that there's five key areas of wellbeing. The most important is career. That is now being validated by what I'm seeing off the back of the program. If people don't have that in their life, then it impacts all of the other areas of their life because we spend such a significant amount of time at work. If you're not happy doing what you love, if you don't enjoy where you are when you walk in there each day, it is going to have an impact on your family life. It's probably going to have an impact on your financial life. And it, there is no question it is going to have an impact on your overall well-being. So and your that, health, yeah. Uh, yeah, and your health. Um, so that piece has come out... Um, a lot, and there's a there's a huge uh, piece that I've seen around the financial well-being. I've seen you know a lot of stuff come off the back where people have recognised that they need to build a robust strategy for their retirement. People aren't contributing enough to superannuation. Um, they don't have. They've probably got higher debt than what they would typically like to have. So it's really about getting a budget. Probably seeing you know seeking some financial advice and also getting their estate planning in order. Um, you know either they don't have a will or it's out of date or potentially it could be contested because they've had a previous relationship breakdown and they haven't sorted out their... We don't think about that, do we, as small yeah. businesses? We yeah. don't think about those personal elements that are being making sure that you've got that financial responsibility. Yeah, totally. And, you know, again, I know that there's, you know, particularly around the health element, there's, there's three core pieces that make up the health element to my program. It's diet, exercise and sleep. We know through the research that there's three core behaviours that lead to the foremost chronic diseases which contribute to 90% of deaths. Smoking, a lack of exercise and diet will contribute directly to heart disease, c cancer, lung disease and diabetes. And those four things lead directly to 90% of deaths in this country. But we also have issues with sleep. 45% of people do not get enough sleep in this country. And when I'm talking about enough sleep, it's between seven and nine hours every single night. Now we know sleep deprivation can have catastrophic events, you know, effects on our overall health and our well-being, stress and anxiety. It leads to a lack of productivity and it can also have severe connections to, you know, disease and illness, but it can also be a result of all of these other elements not being in place. If you're worried about your money, you know, you, you're worried about not having enough in retirement, you're worried about what will happen to the business if you can no longer work in it, you're worried about potentially your estate being contested because you do have a, a previous relationship that's broken down and you haven't sorted that part of your life out, then that is going to have a direct impact on all of these other elements. And so it was all of these things that helped me to create this platform, this program to help people get really conscious about each of these areas and, and start to build a robust plan and a roadmap for, for getting them sorted out so that they can go on to, to live the life that they've always wanted to live. Because at the end of the day, you know, we're, you know, fully integrated, holistic human beings. And whilst we might have, you know, we might be business owners, if we don't sort out all of these other issues, mm. it is going to have an impact on how successful the business is going to be. It's interesting what you were saying about sleep there, actually, because I've often had this um, thought going around in my head that my mum told me when uh, many years ago, because she was very hard worker. Um, and it was the 80s. It was the, the, the time of 24, 25%, God knows what interest rates. And what's interesting is that she'd say, look, why, if you add up all the time that you'd spend thinking about doing something as opposed to actually doing it, you'd probably find that that time took up more than actually just getting it done. And sometimes big tasks like planning for your financial future do take a bit of time, but often it's that first step yep. of understanding, well, I've just got to get some advice yep. or I've got to talk to someone and find the right person to help me or even just do some research for myself online. And sometimes just getting that ball rolling is, is what's required to alleviate the stress and maybe get, maybe get some more um, time back in your hands yep. and sleep. Yep. And one of the things I've learned, again, through, um, through study is that there's no relief in avoidance of any task. There is only relief in getting the task done. So the longer you put this off, knowing that you need to do something, it's just it hangs around and it is like a backpack full of bricks until you actually take the first step to getting this stuff sorted out it just, the voice will always be there reminding you, you should have sorted this out. You could have done that yesterday. Why haven't you just made that one phone call? But I think as you say, you know, when we start to think about these things, they can become overwhelming because they're big. 
So what we need to do is really chunk it down. You mm. know, you've got something that you need to address. What is the absolute very first step that you need to take? Then what is the next step? And then what is the third step? But I think it's about just getting the first step done. And again, you know, through goal achievement strategies that I teach all of the people that come through my program, it's the moment that we start to ask ourselves a question, like, do I feel like going to the gym today? No. It's six o'clock in the morning. <laughs> That is exactly what happens. The brain will create an excuse, a justification and a rationale to get you out of taking that oh, I've action. I've got a bit of a cold coming on. <laughs> it's cold outside. Absolutely. And it'll make you feel better about your choice. Our brain is set up to protect us. And so it will come up with a set of excuses to make us feel better about getting out of not taking the action. Mm. But as I said, we will walk around with a set of backpacks on our, on our mm, back mm, mm. and our brain will constantly be reminding us that we should have gone to the gym, you know. And so it really is about setting yourself up with a set of commands to just do it, just start the task, get it done. The moment you ask yourself a question, forget doing anything, it won't be happening. Mm. And, it, it, and it comes back to what you were saying at the beginning of the program about making your staff feel comfortable and happy in the roles that they're in as well because if they can recognise what it is they're not happy doing, just take it away from them. Yep. Outsource that stress um, to someone lower down the chain or someone that wants to do it. That's right. Because often somebody's strengths are somebody else's weaknesses. Yeah. But it's hard as a business owner, it isn't it? It's hard to prioritise. So when people walk into this potential program with someone such as yourself, um, where do you begin? Because you're covering off so many aspects, almost an entire life is going to be bundled up in these strategies and these, how do you break the ice to get people to understand that we're just going to chunk this down, even though we're going to be looking at everything. So how do you approach it right mm. at the beginning to get people to understand it's yeah. not going to be totally overwhelming? Yeah. So I guess with the program that I've created, um, well, firstly, it's all digital. So it's all online, it's all video based and all of the tools and the templates are integrated into the system, but it's staged into seven distinct modules. If Do you think you like. that's important when people are looking for a program like this is that they look for something that is broken down into into stages that it's not just one big talk about everything in their life well i think then it becomes overwhelming mm -hmm. you know when you start to if you don't chunk it down and you don't start looking at you know different parts of your life you know kind of separately but also integrated then it can become very overwhelming and people just go it's too hard i don't have the time and it that becomes a stress mm. um so my program is staged into seven you know, distinct areas, which really breaks it down into small bite-sized chunks. So in terms of delivering the content, you know, each of the videos that I've created are really between one and three minutes long. So, and each of them have their own beginning and middle and end. So ideally, yes, you would work your way through the program from, you know, beginning all the way through stages one through seven, but it completely allows flexibility. So you might want to go in and just watch a couple of videos in modules one and then skip down to module six, if you say. So you'll still get something out of the program, but it allows complete flexibility in the way that it's delivered. But mm -hmm. I think the important piece here is that the content is chunked down into very small pieces and, you know, people can spend as, as long as they need to working their way you know, through the program. At the moment, I'm running some facilitated versions of that program over an eight-week period. So again, not to overwhelm people and saying that, you know, kind of what I would be suggesting to get through the program over that eight-week period is to just put one hour away a mm, week. Mm. One, people can find one hour. We have 168 in the week. I'm just looking for one hour. That's what I say to people when they're volunteering. <laughs> I just want one. I just want one. <laughs> one, one to turn a sausage. Yeah. But so. um, yeah, no, it's right because you've got to um, you've got to make the time. You've got to make the time, but you've also got to make the time to to do nothing as well and switch yep. off. And and that's what we're so crap at with small businesses. So tell me when you're speaking to those different types of audiences, because I'm always fascinated by um, that role as a speaker because. It's, it's interesting. You might have a, a group of multinational directors sitting in front of you or you might have a group of small businesses. Does the conversation really differ? Is it, is it much of a muchness or is it um, very specific chats that you have to these different groups? Mm, a lot. Of, it's interesting uh, that you ask. I think we all, it doesn't matter who we are, what experience we've got, what job, what role we play, you know, what, what business we've got. We all have very similar kind of issues that we're that we that we're kind of dealing with, mm. and um, so in terms of the content that I specifically 
speak about, it's it's very generic and I think it applies to, it doesn't, a lot of my concepts apply to 15 year old teenagers that have never been taught these concepts in school and they also apply to, you know, 85 year old people that, you know, are kind of in their retirement and in their in their twilight years and, and are looking for something else in their life or need a set of strategies to build resilience or, you know, work out what they want to do with the years that they've got ahead of them. So um, I think my content is is quite generic in the in in the way that it applies to uh, specific people. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that um, you know there's a there's a twist on it. I mean, it depend depending upon you know I might I'm speaking to a bunch of cosmetic surgeons this coming Friday. Right. Um, How does that conversation yeah. go? But the con the concepts and the tools that I'm going to be speaking about are are exactly the same concepts that make up my you know, my seven stage whole of life coaching program, that, but they're also the same concepts that I've spoken to a bunch of financial advisors about and then a bunch of small business owners. So, so it really all, is about the holistic element it totally of it. Is. Yeah. 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 And is it is it more about the the individual really sitting down and I don't want to use the word psychoanalyzing, but almost unpacking themselves to understand where their weaknesses are and what they need to work on and what their strengths are? Is that is that sort of the fundamental backbone of it? Yeah, well I think at the end of the day all behaviour is unconscious, isn't it? So we don't, you know, you don't think about picking up a pen, you just pick up a pen. What my program really helps people to do is to get conscious about where their life is at now across, you know, personally, professionally and financially and help them set up a vision and a strategy for their for their future. So where are they currently at now? Where do they want to be? Mm -hmm. And then it helps them really plug the gaps that are, you know... I guess the the potential obstacles in helping them move from where they are now to where they want to be across each of those areas. Yeah, it's quite uh, it's quite it's it's fundamental, but yet at the same time, it takes into into account everything that's a part of being a small business owner or or uh, or even an executive. It doesn't yeah. really matter who you are; it, it, it all applies. Exactly right. Look, we're just going to take a quick short break here and listen to some uh, advertisements here on Small Biz Matters. Um, you are on Triple H one hundred point one FM. You'll be back after this. Now, all these different aspects, do you find that in your experience, Vicky, look, these are, these are all little chunks of what you can do to improve your business. How many people go into a full state of overwhelm and are beyond help? And what do you do with those sort of people? I mean, do you start looking at succession planning? Do you look at ways of, of helping them exit from, from being in a business? I mean, what, what happens when people are just completely overwhelmed and no longer almost with the ability to help? How do you move them on to a different part of their lives, perhaps? Yeah. Is there any way of recognising that as a small business owner? Mm. Again, I think it, you know, it probably starts with, you know, having a very honest and transparent discussion, really, again, sitting down and, you know, working through what are they actually quite good at, you know, and, and looking at, again, it all comes back to that whole kind of strength. What piece. do you want to do? Yeah. What do you enjoy yeah, doing? A- yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know... Lexi, again, one of the things that I've I've noticed is a lot of people, all they get excited about is getting out of work and retiring. You know, like all, all we want to kind of do is not be working Oh, anymore. no, no, I'm not that person. <laughs> I'm terrified of retiring. I'm, I don't want to retire. I'll just yeah. retire and do volunteer work for hours and hours and hours. But I think that, you know, if we could actually find what it is we really enjoyed doing and what we were passionate about, and yeah. why do we need to retire maybe we just need to slow down maybe we just need to do a few days a week but mm. you know having something in our life and a purpose purpose to get out of bed every single day is just so so important and whether or not that's finding hobbies and things to do with your time um but there there has to be a process where we can kind of unpack what that looks like for us as an individual and then work out what things we can start to do that are going to plug those areas for us and give us that element of well-being and have that financial backbone so that you feel comfortable and not stressed about doing something that you love and that because a a lot of people just continue on doing same old same old because they don't feel that they have a financial choice and maybe they don't because we live in the most expensive ridiculous city in the world Um, but there are ways around that I guess I mean maybe not being so commoditized as you said at the beginning of the program yeah again finding out what you're really good at what you're really passionate about and you know even though you might be kind of working you know five days a week in a role that mm, you know give or take you could do something on the side where you start to package up something that you are quite passionate about and again you know maybe it's about 
I, and I talk to people about find out what you're really good at and what you're passionate about. You know, if it's if it's photography, um, and that's what you really enjoy doing, then how can you start to do more of those things? How do you start to tap into utilising that? Is it you know maybe you could develop a photography course for other people? Maybe make a little digital program, write an ebook, coach kids. You know, what are all the different types of things that you could do? What are all the different types of distribution channels that you could tap into that would actually allow you to focus more in those particular areas? So, you know, again, I've spoken to people and even for myself, you know, my skill set really sits in that kind of coaching development and mentoring piece. So what are all the distribution channels that I have access to in order to tap into those things? Well, I've written a book. I deliver programs. I am a keynote speaker. I've developed a whole lot of digital content. But that, taking all those experiences from yourself, but a lot of people might think to themselves, well, that's, I can't visualize myself being able to do that. I'm not, I can't vocalize what I do. But if you chunk it down, there's probably things that you can do that tap into your passion that uh, may or may not be commercial, but yep. some, at least you're doing something that you love. Absolutely. I think that um, that's why a lot of people come into small business, isn't it? Because they want to find something that they do love to do, but the transition can be difficult. There's been a couple of cases in the last few weeks that I've spoken to someone. Someone's trying to set up a, a workshop for, for parents, um, but I found out the other day she's also working full time. And I think to myself, wow, that's that's really brave. You're trying to get something off the ground, but you've, you, you're still working in your job. Mm. Um, is that a little bit, are you expecting too much of yourself? I mean, it, it, you will burn out if you're trying to do too many things at once, right? Yeah, look, I think that you absolutely need to t- take time out for yourself. There's no question about that. And again, you know, one of the key pieces of building wellbeing is to find what it is we love to do and to do it more often. So whether or not that's yoga, if it's meditation, if it's going for a walk, a swim, taking the dog for a walk, these are the things that you need eating. to... Yeah, eating. eating. <laughs> going out for a long lunch. Um, you know, these are the things that we need to identify and we need to build a plan around making sure that we spend time doing those things. So, yeah, it's got you've got to have time in your week and in your life to be able to just take time out. And I think that whole meditation piece and going doing yoga and, you know, things yeah, like that. I can't meditate, Vicky. I'm sorry. <laughs> I really have tried. My brain just goes off down You've the rabbit hole. You've got too many things on. That's why. <laughs> I know. It's a skill I need to work on in my retirement <laughs> at, when I'm 84. Um, so, look, thank you so much for coming on the program today. It's been absolutely fantastic. Those of you who've just tuned in, it will be available on the blogs and podcasts page of the smallbizmatters.com.au website. We'll let you know via our, our Facebook page when it's available. But look, full of information today. We've learned about about, um, you know, applying these techniques to assist your employees, uh, how to tap into your strengths as a business owner and perhaps look at succession planning or changing if it is something that you're not enjoying doing and what, how to find ways to do more of what you love. And thank you so much for coming on the program today. My pleasure. Now, give us a quick plug. What uh, website can they go to to find out more information about yourself? Ah, the 360degreesolution.com.au. So that's T-H-E 360solution.com.au. Awesome. Look, thank you again for coming on the program. And uh, for those of you who are listening, we'll be back on the program next week with another fantastic guest. We're in the middle of a bit of a guest fest at the moment on Small Biz Matters. And we'll be back um, next Tuesday at 9am. Thank you for listening. My name is Alexi Boy and I'll see you all next week.